One of the best and most convincing pieces of evidence that extraterrestrial civilizations have visited Earth could be the epic Nuremberg space battle of April the 4th, 1561. It was recorded either in 1561 or 1566. Different sources provide different information. All the retellings of this story focus on the woodcut picture and a vague summary of events that occurred that day. The emphasis is always on crash spaceships and space battles. Almost everywhere you read or hear the story, it goes like this. The inhabitants of the city woke up early on an April morning and saw a staggering celestial show that looked like a real space battle. This story sounds even more convincing when you find out that some objects allegedly fought for quite a while. And some even crashed, you can see them in the lower right corner. Look at the picture once again. Orbs and crosses fighting, a giant arrow and bizarre tubes, crashing ships. Wow, that had to be a spectacular cosmic battle. To make it all more plausible, Hans Glazer, the artist behind the woodcut, was a very real person. He really did woodcuts, and this one is indeed from the time and place that it says it is, meaning it's not fake, and it does depict a real event that had its own witnesses. For all intents and purposes, it looks like very convincing proof of aliens visiting us, but don't get your hopes up. A superficial perusal of facts seems to confirm an extraterrestrial presence on our planet. But the most likely explanation is much more mundane. The Nuremberg 1561 UFO battle is just an atmospheric phenomenon called a sundog or parhelion. A sundog is a concentrated spot of sunlight that can sometimes be seen to the right or to the left of the sun or even on its both sides simultaneously. Sundogs often appear as a pair of patches of light with subtle colors at the same altitude over the horizon as the sun. They can have a variety of forms, from colorful spots to patches of light so intense and bright, it looks like there are two additional suns in the sky. Sundogs are weird looking enough to make it seem that something scary and otherworldly is going on in the sky. At the same time, it's just our planet's atmosphere or ice in the upper parts of the sky acting as a prism or reflective device. This prism makes the light from the sun or moon do weird things. This image can help you visualize the phenomenon. Apparently, Nuremberg had the perfect conditions for this phenomenon to occur. If you examine the depiction of this event and compare it with modern pictures and videos, you'll soon realize that a sundog is indeed a more likely explanation than the galactic empire paying us a visit. Let's find the proof of this statement in the translated description of these events and in the woodcut picture itself. First, the sun showed and was seen with two blood-colored half-round strokes, like the diminishing moon right through the sun, and in the sun, above, under, and on both sides, stood blood-colored and partly bluish, or iron-colored, also black-colored round orbs. Now here's the photo of a sundog. It has a halo surrounding it, and a red orb. And if we have at least one red orb, there could be others showing up during other events. Plus, keep in mind that sundogs are like prisms. So, depending on how light is reflected, there could be multiple colors present during such a phenomenon. Now, referring to circled plates mentioned in the description, those could be halos. For example, this sun halo looks vaguely plate-like, and it seems to be linked to other sun halos. And indeed, people have seen halos with multiple orbs. Some of the orbs could have taken a cross-like shape. If we watch some modern videos of sundogs, we might notice that the orbs on film are sun-colored. But since the Nuremberg event happened between 4 and 5 a.m., the clouds and the sun could have had reddish and orange hues. As for the fighting, it could be as simple as one shape moving a bit and changing shape along with the movements of the sun. It could have looked as if it was pushing the other shapes out of the way. Do you agree with the scientific explanation? Or do you prefer to think that Earth was visited by guests from a galaxy far, far away? Write your opinion in the comments. One of the best and most convincing pieces of evidence that extraterrestrial civilizations have visited Earth could be the epic Nuremberg space battle of April the 4th, 1561. It was recorded either in 1561 
or 1566 different sources provide different information. All the retellings of this story focus on the woodcut picture and a vague summary of events that occurred that day. The emphasis is always on crash spaceships and space battles. Almost everywhere you read or hear the story, it goes like this. The inhabitants of the city woke up early on an April morning and saw a staggering celestial show that looked like a real space battle. This story sounds even more convincing when you find out that some objects allegedly fought for quite a while. And some even crashed, you can see them in the lower right corner. Look at the picture once again. Orbs and crosses fighting, a giant arrow and bizarre tubes, crashing ships. Wow, that had to be a spectacular cosmic battle. To make it all more plausible, Hans Glazer, the artist behind the woodcut, was a very real person. He really did woodcuts, and this one is indeed from the time and place that it says it is, meaning it's not fake, and it does depict a real event that had its own witnesses. For all intents and purposes, it looks like very convincing proof of aliens visiting us, but don't get your hopes up. A superficial perusal of facts seems to confirm an extraterrestrial presence on our planet but the most likely explanation is much more mundane. The Nuremberg 1561 UFO battle is just an atmospheric phenomenon called a sundog or parhelion. A sundog is a concentrated spot of sunlight that can sometimes be seen to the right or to the left of the sun or even on its both sides simultaneously. Sundogs often appear as a pair of patches of light with subtle colors at the same altitude over the horizon as the sun. They can have a variety of forms, from colorful spots to patches of light so intense and bright, it looks like there are two additional suns in the sky. Sundogs are weird looking enough to make it seem that something scary and otherworldly is going on in the sky. At the same time, it's just our planet's atmosphere or ice in the upper parts of the sky acting as a prism or reflective device. This prism makes the light from the sun or moon do weird things. This image can help you visualize the phenomenon. Apparently, Nuremberg had the perfect conditions for this phenomenon to occur. If you examine the depiction of this event and compare it with modern pictures and videos, you'll soon realize that a sundog is indeed a more likely explanation than the galactic empire paying us a visit. Let's find the proof of this statement in the translated description of these events and in the woodcut picture itself. First, the sun showed and was seen with two blood-colored half-round strokes, like the diminishing moon right through the sun, and in the sun, above, under, and on both sides, stood blood-colored and partly bluish, or iron-colored, also, black-colored round orbs. Now here's the photo of a sundog. It has a halo surrounding it, and a red orb. And if we have at least one red orb, there could be others showing up during other events. Plus, keep in mind that sundogs are like prisms. So, depending on how light is reflected, there could be multiple colors present during such a phenomenon. Now, referring to circled plates mentioned in the description, those could be halos. For example, this sun halo looks vaguely plate-like, and it seems to be linked to other sun halos, and indeed, people have seen halos with multiple orbs. Some of the orbs could have taken a cross-like shape. If we watch some modern videos of sun dogs, we might notice that the orbs on film are sun-colored. But since the Nuremberg event happened between 4 and 5 a.m., the clouds and the sun could have had reddish and orange hues. As for the fighting, it could be as simple as one shape moving a bit and changing shape along with the movements of the sun. It could have looked as if it was pushing the other shapes out of the way. Do you agree with the scientific explanation? Or do you prefer to think that Earth was visited by guests from a galaxy far, far away? Write your opinion in the comments. It's the year 1977, and astronomers are stunned They've just picked up a bizarre and really powerful radio signal coming from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. The signal shockingly matches the frequency of neutral hydrogen. What's the big deal? This is the very frequency many astronomers believe might be used by extraterrestrial civilizations trying to communicate. Since then, the signal has become legendary in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence a.k.a. SETI. 
community. But what exactly was that mysterious signal? To understand this, let's go back to the 1970s when the Ohio State University Big Ear Radio Telescope was active. For more than two decades, from 1973 to 1995, it played a major role in the university's SETI program. By the way, it was the longest running SETI project in history. And in 1977, Big Ear detected something extraordinary, the WOW signal. This wasn't just any signal. It was a strong narrowband radio signal right near the important neutral hydrogen frequency. The Big Ear telescope might be gone now, but the mystery of the WOW signal still fascinates scientists today. Imagine this. You want to tell an extraterrestrial civilization about humans. How would you describe our average height? We can't use feet or inches because these units mean nothing to them. Even here on Earth, we don't all use the same measurements. To communicate with other civilizations, we need a universal way of conveying information. Luckily, the emission of light by matter comes from an electron jumping between quantum states in an atom. This process, governed by quantum mechanics, results in specific and fixed radiation frequencies and wavelengths, no matter where you are in the universe. Since we believe the laws of physics are the same everywhere, these wavelengths are universal. This makes them a perfect standard of measurement that any civilization could understand. For example, on the Pioneer spacecraft's gold plaque, we used a particular wavelength as a unit of length to describe information about humans and the spacecraft's origin. So, if an extraterrestrial civilization wanted to talk to us, they could have used the frequency of the WOW signal. And that's pretty amazing. The signal lasted the entire 72 seconds that Big Ear was tuned in. A few days later, astronomer Jerry R. Amon was looking over the data when he spotted the unusual signal on a computer printout. He was so surprised that he wrote WOW next to it, and that's how the signal got its famous name. The signal also has another not-so-exciting name, 6EQJ5. Some people thought it might be a hidden message, but it actually just shows how the signal's intensity changed over time. The WOW signal sparked all kinds of theories. Some people believed it was a sign of extraterrestrial life, while others were sure that it was some interference from human activities. There were those who believed it could be a natural phenomenon we didn't understand yet. New research seems to have finally solved the mystery, but there's one thing we'll talk about a bit later. First, let's get into detail. A team of scientists, led by Abel Mendez from the Planetary Habitability Laboratory at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo, revisited the mystery using data from the now-closed Arecibo Radio Telescope, collected between 2017 and 2020. These observations were similar to those made by Big Ear, but they had better sensitivity, resolution, and polarization measurements. Arecibo detected signals similar to the WOW signal, but there were some important differences. These signals were less intense and came from multiple locations, the scientists believe that these signals, including the original WOW signal, can be explained by natural events in space. Their theory sounds like this. The WOW signal was likely caused by a sudden brightening of hydrogen due to a strong, short-lived radiation source. It could be a magnetar flare or a soft gamma repeater, SGR. A magnetar is a neutron star with a way stronger magnetic field than ordinary neutron stars. And an SGR is an astronomical object which emits large bursts of gamma rays and X-rays at irregular intervals. In any case, such events are pretty rare and depend on very specific conditions. But they can cause hydrogen clouds to light up for short periods. According to the researchers, what Big Ear picked up in 1977 was one of those bright hydrogen clouds in its line of sight. The study suggests that the signal's rarity can be explained by the precise alignment needed between the radiation source, the hydrogen cloud, and the observer. It means that the WOW signal may actually be the first recorded instance of an astronomical maser flare in the hydrogen line. In the middle of the previous century, flying saucers were constantly making headlines. America was going through a surge of reported UFO sightings. 
So it shouldn't probably come as a surprise that the American authorities, namely the U.S. Air Force, created a couple of short-lived programs. Those were Project Sign and Project Grudge, and their main goal was to look into that phenomenon. These programs were followed by likely the most famous of them all, Project Blue Book. It was a large-scale government study that lasted from 1951 to 1969. The initiator of this program was Major General Charles P. Cabell. He was a former intelligence director of the Air Force. Project Blue Book scrupulously gathered over 12,600 reports about people seeing bizarre unidentified objects in the sky. After a thorough research, it was determined that most of those had natural, quite mundane explanations. As for the rest of the reports, the members of Project Blue Book simply didn't have enough data to evaluate them. That's why support for their efforts dwindled. Officially, Project Blue Book was closed in December 1969. But apparently, it didn't make American authorities lose interest in UFO sightings. Because in mid-December 2017, the world found out that they had secretly launched one more UFO research program in the late 2000s. Accordingly to certain documents, American authorities spent around $22 million over a four-year span on a project called the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, aka AADIP. This project was started in 2007 and its main goal was to study UFO phenomena. Most likely, all this activity was triggered by the 2004 Tic Tac incident. That's when a few U.S. Air Force pilots spotted unidentified flying objects off the coast of California. They captured them on video. None of the pilots could figure out what these objects were. They behaved in a weird way, as if our laws of physics didn't apply to them. They were reportedly flying extremely fast and rotating in unpredictable movements. It looks as if after that incident, American authorities decided to investigate whether those objects could be identified or not. And if not, they were eager to know where they had come from and if they had been a threat. When the New York Times story about the new project broke, officials announced that the study had been terminated in 2012. Uh, however, there were people who claimed that the program was still ongoing. One of those was a military intelligence official running the program until they quit in October 2016. In any case, let's have a closer look at this mysterious program. Indeed, the areas of research funded by the project resembled things you could find in Star Trek. For example, one grant was for the study of traversable wormholes, stargates, and negative energy. This study was conducted by Eric W. Davis of Earth Tech International Inc. Another grant sponsored the research of invisibility cloaking. One more area of study included warp drive, dark energy, and the manipulation of extra dimensions. This research was conducted by a theoretical physicist and director of the nonprofit Icarus Interstellar. As we've already mentioned, all these studies received at least $22 million of funding, but this sum could have been much bigger. No one has revealed why or how these studies were given such huge grants under the AATI program. The results of the study aren't known publicly either. The criteria for choosing these fields of research could be that warp drives and stargates might be useful for extraterrestrial civilizations traveling interstellar distances to visit our planet. Still, some people are not amused that such questionable fields of study were receiving substantial government funding. A Dyson Sphere is a theoretical mega-project, a ginormous sphere encircling a star with platforms orbiting in tight formation. It's supposed to be an ultimate solution both for energy production and living space. The creators of a Dyson Sphere get a lot of surface area for habitation and the ability to catch every tiny bit of solar radiation and heat produced by their central star. The first person to theorize about such a bizarre construction was British-American theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson. According to him, an intelligent extraterrestrial civilization could consider building this sphere after colonizing some moons and planets in their local stellar neighborhood. 
With the growth of their population, these aliens would need more and more energy to sustain their lives. Dyson calculated that assuming that this alien society grew at 1% per year, their area and energy needs would become a trillion times larger in a mere 3,000 years. And if their solar system contained a space body similar in size to Jupiter, they could take it apart and spread its mass in a spherical shell by building a structure at twice the distance between our planet and the Sun. This amount of material would be sufficient to build a huge number of orbiting platforms. Each of them could be six to ten feet thick, which would basically allow this civilization to live on their star-facing surfaces. A shell this thick could be comfortably habitable and capable of holding all the equipment needed for using solar radiation without falling onto the star from the inside. But after absorbing all this solar energy, the sphere would have to re-radiate it. Otherwise, the energy would build up, eventually causing the construction to melt. It means that the light of a star wrapped in a Dyson sphere would look dimmed or even completely darkened, depending on how dense the platforms orbiting it were. At the same time, it would glow unusually bright in infrared wavelengths invisible to the unaided eye. Because of this infrared radiation, Dyson spheres are classified as a type of techno-signature. It's a sign of activity that astronomers can use to discover intelligent life forms in the universe. Some Earth-based researchers have infrared maps of the night sky they examine in hopes of spotting Dyson spheres. So far, no one has ever found one. However, one study has selected several Dyson sphere candidates. Its authors have processed large amounts of information using a special data pipeline for combining and analyzing information. One of the main search criteria is the detection of excessive infrared radiation. At the same time, it's important to distinguish this radiation from that emitted by natural objects. After a complicated filtering of millions of objects, the researchers identified seven potential Dyson spheres. Sure, further analysis is needed to determine their nature. To do this, scientists want to use optical spectroscopy, which may reveal more details about these objects and their origins. At the same time, the researchers admit that these candidate Dyson spheres might have other explanations. For example, they could be debris disks or protoplanetary disks of young stars. Only more research can show whether we can find traces of other civilizations among star systems. For now, it's still an open question. Interestingly, Dyson spheres have been spoken about a lot in science fiction. As far back as 1937, a novel called Star Maker by Olaf Stapledon described systems in one particular galaxy that were surrounded by a gauze of light traps which focused solar energy for intelligent use. That was the reason why the entire galaxy was dim. In another novel, Ring World, the writer spoke about a ring-shaped artificial structure surrounding a star. We could use one of the largest lasers in the world to detect alien spaceships. If aliens existed and managed to make a spacecraft as huge as Jupiter, our equipment could probably detect it using the ripples its warp drives would produce in space-time. You see, an enormous spaceship is bound to produce gravitational waves while moving around. You can read about a warp drive, also called a drive-enabling space warp, in science fiction. This device distorts the shape of the space-time continuum and is one of several ways of traveling through space. It's often described as similar to hyperspace, a faster-than-light method of interstellar travel. A spaceship equipped with a warp drive can travel at speeds greater than the speed of light by many orders of magnitude. But unlike some other fictitious faster-than-light methods of travel, like a jump drive, it doesn't permit immediate transfers between two points. Instead, it involves a measurable passage of time. A spacecraft using a warp drive would still keep interacting with objects in normal space and produce gravitational waves too. That's why if any extraterrestrial gigantic spacecraft traveled through our galaxy, the Laser Interferometer, Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, in the U.S. might be able to detect it. 
its equipment could search for the ripples in the fabric of space-time left by the spaceship. The bigger an object is, the larger gravitational waves it would leave. Planets, neutron stars, and even black holes produce quite prominent ripples. For the first time, such space-time ripples were directly detected in 2015. And since then, scientists have been getting better and better at spotting gravitational waves. New calculations published at some time ago suggested that LIGO could look beyond conventional sources of space-time ripples. The authors of the study claimed that colossal alien spacecraft traveling at high speeds or pushed along by warp drives could also produce the telltale vibrations. The LIGO detector notices gravitational waves from the tiniest distortions they make in space-time when passing through it. The observatory consists of two intersecting L-shaped detectors, each with two arms that are almost two and a half miles long. They also have two identical laser beams inside. The experiment is designed in such a way that if a gradational wave passes through our planet, the laser light in one arm of the detector gets compressed while the other expands. It creates a minuscule change in the relative path lengths of the beams arriving at the detector. At the same time, the warpings of space-time that even the largest gravitational waves make are barely noticeable. They're often the size of a few thousandths of a proton or neutron. It means that LIGO is incredibly sensitive and requires precise maintenance and calibration. To check how far this sensitivity can stretch, researchers made calculations of the smallest object that would produce clearly detectable gravitational waves on Earth. Apparently, it would still be pretty big. To be detectable by LIGO, an alien spacecraft would need to weigh roughly the same as Jupiter, be within 326,000 light-years away from Earth, and travel at one-tenth the speed of light. Could spaceships of this scale and speed exist? It's unclear. But hopefully, scientists will be able to squeeze down the ship's size to slightly more reasonable proportions thanks to the increasing sensitivity of gravitational wave detectors. For example, in the mid-30s, the European Space Agency's laser interferometer, space antenna, is going to be deployed. Scientists also think that advanced alien warp drives could create a gravitational wave patterns distinguishable from natural sources. If detected, these alien waves could probe at use with answers to how to reverse engineer the technology. All because the shape of the gravitational wave signal is dependent on the trajectory of an object. Once a burst signal is detected, we could attempt to figure out the qualities of the transportation mechanism used there based on the shape of the gravitational wave signal. How about I tell you that aliens might exist? I know it probably goes against everything you believe in, but it's a new model of the universe that could explain how intelligent life spreads and distributes. This model makes lots of predictions. For example, we should expect to meet another civilization at some point. It also mentions our chances of starting to get messages from aliens, or even becoming an interplanetary civilization ourselves. This model also explains why we haven't met other space civilizations yet, considering the huge number of stars and galaxies in the universe. But let's go into detail. The main assumption of the model is that, at one point, a civilization existing in the vastness of the cosmos can become... grabby. You see, there are two types of civilizations. Quiet aliens don't actually try to expand. Neither do they change much. And after some time, they just disappear. That might be the reason why we don't have any data about them. And all that is left to do is to make speculations about their existence. But there are also loud aliens. They supposedly keep spreading really fast until they meet other space civilizations. The model also calls these loud aliens grabby. That's because they expand from their home planet at a fraction of the speed of light. They also make significant and visible changes wherever they travel. And they last for a really long time, too. Why might we suppose that grabby aliens exist? Because their existence may be the most plausible explanation for why humanity appeared so early in the history of the universe. See for yourself. The current date is 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. Small stars can burn their cosmic fuel for up to a trillion years. And according to the standard model of the origin of advanced life, it's more likely to appear at the end of the longest planet lifetimes. 
Well, grabby aliens might be to blame for our early appearance. Such civilizations could set deadlines for others. If such aliens indeed exist, they will occupy most of the observable universe really soon. And when they succeed, no other civilizations will be able to appear, because all the habitable planets will already be taken. A civilization like ours, advanced but not grabby yet, could only appear early, because later it wouldn't have a chance to do it. There's another reason why the idea of grabby aliens seems plausible. Look at life on Earth, like humans. Aren't we grabby in many ways, too? Species, cultures, and companies tend to expand and occupy new niches and territories as fast as they can. For example, species spreading on new territories get access to new resources, and thus increase their population. Why shouldn't we expect the same behavior from extraterrestrial civilizations? The main author of this model, Robin Hansen, was also the first to introduce the idea of the Great Filter in 1996. According to the Great Filter Theory, the universe is filled with countless life forms. But people haven't stumbled across any of them yet, because somewhere, there is a Great Filter. The main purpose of this filter is to stop and finish those civilizations that advance to the level of star colonization. Suppose that this idea is true. There are three possible scenarios for our civilization. The first one. We're unique because we have passed the Great Filter. Other civilizations haven't managed to make it this far. The second scenario goes like this. We're among the first potential colonizers. Before the conditions in space were too harsh for life forms to leave their home planets. In this case, chances are high that we'll soon encounter other civilizations. And the third scenario is quite worrying. We haven't reached the level of technological development that is advanced enough for the filter to locate us. This means that we haven't passed the filter yet. In other words, the trial is still ahead, and it's a big question if we manage to pass it. If the multiverse theory is correct, ours is not the only one out there. Which is as interesting as it is scary, right? Now, not every scientist is on board with this mind-bending concept. And let's be honest, the idea of actually making contact with these parallel universes sounds about as probable as winning the lottery while riding a unicycle. But hold on tight, because this strange concept isn't just limited to the realms of fiction anymore. Believe it or not, a bunch of scientific theories actually support the existence of parallel universes. And let me tell you, it's a topic that stirs up quite the debate in scientific groups. Now picture this. The universe we live in is mind-numbingly vast. We're talking billions, some say even trillions, of galaxies swirling around, each packed with an almost uncountable number of stars. Some brainiacs studying the universe's shape suggest that its diameter could span a staggering seven billion light years. Others even argue that it might be infinite. Could there be more out there than meets the eye? Well, real scientific theories are exploring the possibility of universes existing alongside, beyond, or even mirroring our own. These intriguing concepts of multiverses and parallel worlds often intertwine with other, more familiar scientific ideas like the Big Bang, string theory, and quantum mechanics. In order for us to figure out what's out there, we have to rely on the information we're a bit more confident in, right? Let's rewind the cosmic clock about 13.7 billion years ago. Everything we're able to see today was squished into a minuscule singularity. Then, if the Big Bang theory is to be trusted, it all went boom. The universe inflated with a speed faster than that of light everywhere, within less than a second. The way the universe went pop has led some clever researchers to ponder the existence of more than one universe. They question whether that sudden growth ended everywhere at the same time. While the expansion ceased for everything we're able to see from Earth 13.8 billion years ago, cosmic inflation might still be ongoing in some other mysterious corners. Some theoretical physicists say that as inflation ends in one place, a new balloon universe forms. But here's the catch. You can't just hop from one bubble to another like intergalactic tourists. These bubble universes are expanding indefinitely, and their edges are zooming away from us faster than light can travel. And here's where things get even more confusing. 
Let's say we somehow manage to reach the edge of our local balloon and encounter the next universe. Well, those same theoretical physicists mentioned that the neighboring universe could be a whole different ball game. It might have completely different laws of physics, making it a bizarre place for us. Following the same idea, some say that in this vast multiverse of bubble universes, there might be other life forms just like us. The problem is, we're getting farther away from them with each passing moment, and our paths will never cross. Other super smart researchers out there are trying to connect parallel universes with quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics is basically the fancy math behind teeny tiny particles. According to it, these particles can exist in multiple states all at once. They call it a wave function that holds all the crazy options. But here's the catch. When we observe these particles, we only see one outcome. It's like the universe keeps playing hide and seek with us. Now there's this theory called the many worlds theory that says whenever we observe one outcome, another universe pops up where a different outcome becomes real. It's like our universe acts as a giant tree, constantly branching into countless versions of itself. These alternate universes can't mingle though, so you wouldn't even know if there are a bunch of other yous living slightly, or totally, different lives. This many worlds theory is pretty bold, and a bit hard to prove or disprove. And that's not great for science, because scientists love to test and experiment with their ideas. But if there's infinite space out there, why wouldn't there be infinite universes too? Try to imagine the universe as this giant cosmic playground. Some specialists believe that if it's indeed never-ending, then there's only a limited number of ways that its building blocks can arrange themselves. Eventually, they have to repeat certain patterns. If this is true, then it may be possible that somewhere out there, there might be another version of you living the exact same life, even down to what you had for brunch yesterday. Did we ever have any proof of these supposed parallel universes? Well, some say we did. Have you heard the tale of the mysterious man from Taured? It's the story of a man that ended up at a Japanese airport saying he was from a totally unknown country called Tored. Now, some folks think it's proof of time travel, while others believe it's evidence he came from a different universe altogether. As much as you'd like to believe the story to be factual, the tricky part is this Torrid place. There's a reason you haven't heard of it. There's no Torrid to be found, whether in the present day or back in the 1950s when this supposed incident happened. After the airport incident, the man just vanished into thin air a day after arriving in Japan. Poof, gone forever. Let's rewind to that fateful day in July 1954 when the man from Torred supposedly landed in Tokyo. Descriptions paint him as a bearded, French-speaking man. Nothing too outlandish so far, right? Depending on who's telling the story, things start to diverge a bit. In one version, when the man hands over his passport to get stamped, the Japanese officer's eyes bulge out. While the passport looked legit, the country listed as Torrid isn't recognized by anyone, including the officer and other officials. Naturally, they take our Torrid visitor away for a little Q&A session. In another version, the man straight up tells the officer he's from Torrid and shows him the passport when he doesn't buy it. Our man from Torrid then started trying to convince the officers that his homeland is the real deal. According to him, Torrid sat snugly between France and Spain and would have been around for about 1,000 years. To prove his point, he even points to the area on a map that matches the Principality of Andorra. Obviously, things took a mysterious turn. The officers decided to hold the man in custody, suspecting he might be up to no good. They put him up in a nearby hotel for the night, but not without stationing two people outside his room to keep an eye on things. Can you guess what happens next? Drum roll, please. When the officers showed up the next morning, ready to continue their investigation, the man had vanished without a trace. No sign of escape, and to make matters even more puzzling, all his personal documents have magically vanished too. What if the man from Torrid was a time traveler, or an intergalactic adventurer? Some have even delved into the realms of science fiction to explain this bizarre event, and you won't believe the number of people on the internet who've latched onto it as evidence for alternate realities. One of the weirdest ideas suggests that the man accidentally stumbled into a parallel dimension and ended up at the Japanese airport. 
In that parallel universe, there's an Earth just like ours. But instead of Andorra, they call it Torrid over there. Another idea floating around was that the man was a time traveler from the future. Sorry to break it to you, but the most reasonable explanation for the whole story of the man from Tord is that someone's imagination went wild. Since there are many versions of the same story, it's probable people just kept adding outrageous details to the case, to make it more sensational. The whole story simply snowballed into an urban legend, and there's little to no reason to believe we've once seen a time traveler or intergalactic hitchhiker right here on Earth. Our galaxy is home to 200 billion stars and maybe a hundred billion planets. Let's imagine that life exists on a tiny fraction of those places. And let's imagine that those lives could evolve into intelligent beings. Given that, it would seem safe to say that our galaxy would be populated and some species would be actively trying to find us. We have an equation called the Drake Equation that can estimate how many intelligent civilizations might arise in our galaxy. The equation suggests that there should be around 20 civilizations just on the outskirts of our galaxy. So why haven't we encountered any of them yet? The work of Frank Drake, a radio astronomer published in 1961, is a set of many variables, such as the average number of planets in a solar system that could potentially harbor life or the rate at which stars are suitable for intelligent life form. The complexity here is that astronomers have yet to determine the exact values of these variables, meaning that our calculations are still only approximate. But recent discoveries in these areas give us hope that we can refine these estimates. Let's use our hypothetical assumptions and apply them to our galaxy. Let's crunch the numbers, and it comes up to at least 20 civilizations. Yet. Somehow, the sky remains strangely silent. How did this happen? Some people think that the appearance of life is a rare event. Others think that the transition from bacteria to highly developed beings is a difficult step. Still others believe that civilizations may either destroy themselves after a short lifespan, or may never even invent something with which they could communicate. But there is one theory that surpasses all the others in its creepiness the dark forest theory. According to it, the universe is a vast cosmic version of a haunted forest, and other kinds of beings are out there somewhere playing hide and seek. They are deliberately keeping silent. Why? Well, for starters, every form of life wants to survive. If we start with that assumption, we can ask the question, will other forms of life harm you if they have the chance? So, the safest option is to destroy them before they find the right time to do the same to you. Frankly speaking, this is a cosmic version of survival of the fittest. In this scenario, making contact with others becomes the most dangerous game, as it could lead to your location being tracked down and you being destroyed. The theory was proposed by scientist David Brin as a possible explanation for the lack of radio evidence for the existence of life. But how realistic is this theory? Only one advanced race behaving in this way could answer that question. So far, this theory explains why we are not picking up any advanced radio transmissions despite a century of listening. It is possible that other beings like us are too afraid of being noticed and have deliberately gone silent. It is worth considering that there may have been a point at which everyone decided to keep quiet. Was it an aggressive civilization that deliberately wiped out the noisy aliens? The question is open. For about a century now, we have been those very noisy aliens. Any other civilization within a hundred light years of us can receive our signals and know exactly where we are. And if we have reasons to hide from them, as some people such as Stephen Hawking suggest, we may already be in trouble. So will we ever receive a message from our cosmic partners? Only time will tell. But what we do know for sure is that we cannot just brush this off. We cannot allow panic to spread across the planet when we receive that alien WhatsApp. We need to have a plan, and we need to have it ready by the time we are faced with the real situation. The US authorities have investigated over a hundred cases of strange phenomena occurring in the sky. No little green men have ever been found, more likely drones and similar objects. 
Whether our intergalactic neighbors will send us a message tomorrow or centuries later, we need a plan. After all, this could change everything we know about our universe and our place in it. In 2017, a strange object was spotted in our solar system. It had the shape of a long tube, similar to a pancake. No known asteroid or comet we've seen looks like that. Its exterior was also peculiar. It was at least 10 times more reflective than the average stuff that flies through space, with some saying it had a surface similar to polished metal. When it went past the sun and left our reach, it accelerated faster than what our gravity could account for. At first glance, it was like this thing had a rocket strapped to its back. This unusual visitor even got a special name, a Muamua. It comes from Hawaiian and translates to scout or visitor from a faraway land. And because of its characteristics, scientists soon began to wonder if this was at last a visit from otherworldly creatures. Before they went full on with the science fiction suppositions, Astronomers gathered the information they were sure about, starting with the fact that Oumuamua must have come from another solar system. There must have been some unfortunate event in its home system that led to its ejection. What they didn't know was that this was a comet or asteroid. They're both celestial objects orbiting a sun, but they have distinct compositions and behaviors. Comets are composed primarily of ice, dust, and rocky material, often referred to as dirty snowballs. When a comet approaches the sun, the heat causes the ice to vaporize, releasing gas and dust particles into space. This creates a bright glowing tail that can extend for millions of miles. Comets generally have elliptical orbits, often taking them from the distant reaches of our solar system closer to the sun. Asteroids, however, are mostly made of rock and metal. In our neighborhood, they are remnants of the early formation of the solar system and are typically found in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Unlike comets, asteroids do not develop tails when they approach the Sun, as they have no ice. Their orbits generally follow more circular paths compared to comets. By all accounts, Oumuamua should be a comet, because it seems to come from a different location in the universe. Yet, it doesn't exhibit the typical signs of cometary activity. Oumuamua lacks a tail and does not spew out gas as it passes by, not like me. Even though it behaves like a comet, it looks more like an asteroid. Now another big question is how scientists even managed to spot Oumuamua in the first place. Considering the vastness of space and time in the galaxy, it's remarkable. Stars have lifetimes spanning millions or billions of years. And the formation of a solar system takes hundreds of millions of years. Even the fastest objects take tens of thousands of years to travel from one star to another. In contrast, humans have only been observing the skies with telescopes for around 400 years, a tiny fraction of cosmic time. And it's only in recent decades, even years, that we've had the technology to detect and track fast-moving, dim objects. Either rocks like these are abundant, or we've been incredibly lucky with our detections. Or it simply wanted to be seen. Now another question that was asked was where such objects could come from. It's highly unlikely that Oumuamua came from a mature, stable solar system. That's because such systems don't eject enough material to fill up the galaxy. Occasionally, a random rock might get flung out but it can rarely travel so far. Young systems, however, act differently. In these chaotic environments, collisions, mergers, and migrations are happening everywhere. Plenty of tiny rocks roam around, perfect candidates for ejection. The solar system that kicked Oumuamua out must have had a planet similar to Jupiter. Its massive size and gravity could influence other objects in the system, causing potential ejections. But not all solar systems develop Jupiter-sized planets. Often, massive planets end up close to their stars, becoming hotter versions of Jupiter. These planets, snugly orbiting a sun, are less likely to eject debris. Now, Neptune-like planets may play a role, too. While not as massive as Jupiter, they tend to call the outer regions of solar systems their home. Our solar system has the Kuiper Belt, a reservoir of comets in its outer reaches. During a solar system's early stages, interactions between Neptune-like planets and debris are common. 
Finding Neptune-like planets in other systems has been challenging, though. Our methods for detecting exoplanets work better for massive objects close to their stars, making it difficult to spot Neptune counterparts farther out. Oumuamua was also linked to a peculiar theory about how life came to be in the universe, panspermia. Now that's a hypothesis that suggests that life exists throughout the universe and can be distributed between planets by various means such as asteroids, comets, or even spacecraft. It says that life must have originated in one location in the universe and then spread to other celestial bodies. Fans of the panspermia theory have suggested that such interstellar objects could potentially carry tiny microbes, those building blocks of life between star systems. If such objects were to impact a planet or a moon, they could transfer these materials and seed the celestial body with life. For now, there is no evidence to support the theory that this comet in particular has transported life between star systems. After years of research, the overall consensus became that Oumuamua was indeed a comet. The reason why it moves so strangely is because it might have frozen hydrogen on its surface that reacts when touched by sunlight. The closer it got to our sun, the faster it became releasing that hydrogen and also changing its path to our solar system. Its color also supports this theory. It's red, which might mean it's been hit by cosmic rays for a long time. The longer it was touched by those rays, the more hydrogen it gathered in the process. But since they can't be completely sure, astronomers have a plan to follow this visitor. One idea is to send a mission to check it out. It's already far away from us, but it may not be too late just yet. We may be able to send a probe fast enough to catch up with the comet. The plan was named Project Lyra and aims to use the Earth's orbit and that of Jupiter to bounce out a probe far enough to reach Oumuamua. If it works, it will be the fastest space device we've sent out in the universe. One potential trajectory of the space probe involves the gravitational pull of our planet and that of Jupiter as a lasso effect but not Ted Lasso. The probe will leave our planet and re-enter Earth's orbit before sending it to meet with Jupiter's pull. It will be sent back near our planet a second time, where it will be ejected with enough force to reach the comet. Project Lyra also aims to follow a second faraway visitor named Borisov. This one was discovered by an amateur astronomer and now bears his name. What's interesting about it is that it's, well, spotless. Similar to our experience with Oumuamua, we haven't seen anything like Borisov before either. Studies of the light coming from its cloud of dust and gas show it's very clean compared to other space objects. After it was first noticed in August 2019, astronomers studied its path through our solar system and concluded it came from another star too. But Borisov gave us more time to study it because we spotted it earlier in its journey through our neighborhood. Researchers used advanced telescopes to look at the dust coming off Borisov. They found it's throwing off over 400 pounds of dust every second. They also found Borisov has more carbon monoxide than comets from our solar system usually do. But the amount isn't the same everywhere on the comet. This tells us the space object probably started forming near its home star before moving away, maybe because of larger planets in its system. The light from Borisov is way more polarized than light from other comets we've seen, and its cloud is super smooth. This tells us Borisov has never interacted with another star. Now, in the 70s, we received a radio signal that lasted more than a minute, and to this day, no one knows what it was or where it was coming from. But now, a new theory has appeared. Could the mystery finally be solved? In 1977, at 1116 p.m., a telescope in Ohio caught something very unusual in space. It was a super short radio signal, just 72 seconds long. The signal was so strong and weird that the scientist who found it wrote WOW in red ink next to it. That's why it's called the WOW signal. Now in space, hydrogen gas sometimes releases radio waves, a type of electromagnetic radiation. 
They emit at a specific frequency, which is like a unique signature for hydrogen gas. This helps us to find, identify, and study it. Thanks to this, we noticed that the wow signal frequency came from the same place as this gas. But it's not like it helps much, because we still have no idea what emitted it. What's even stranger, the signal happened only once. Even though we tried really hard to hear it again, we never did. And without a repeat signal, it was impossible to tell what it was. It's hard for us to even get its precise location, because the signal was short-lived. After a certain distance, it's very hard to tell where different radio signals are coming from. And that's where the theory started. This particular frequency that the WOW signal was on is special. It's not crowded with a lot of other signals. It's like finding a quiet spot in a noisy room. Because there's not much interference or noise. So if you send a signal on this frequency really far, it won't get lost or distorted. And that's curious. Because it means that there might be a perfect place to send messages if we want to communicate with any extraterrestrial creatures out there. So could it be that they're trying to contact us? Well, it's a real scientific possibility. No one knows for sure what caused the wow signal. But if it was from something extraterrestrial, they definitely communicate not like we do. The signal looked nothing like a deliberate message. And that's weird that it happened only once. If it was little green people trying to contact us, it would be weird for them to only try once. But just in case, in 2012, on the 35th anniversary of the WOW signal, we decided to send out a bunch of messages towards certain stars. We used a special code to make sure any extraterrestrial creatures who got the messages would know they were from intelligent beings like us. Well, mostly intelligent. We even used a lot of power to make sure the messages could travel really far. Scientists have come up with lots of ideas about where the WOW signal might have come from. But none of them are widely agreed upon. We know for sure that it didn't come from anything on Earth. Earth noise can interfere sometimes. But this signal definitely came from outer space. There was also a theory that the signal might have bounced off some space junk and come back to Earth. But later, we realized that the requirements for that to happen were very unlikely. One potential idea is that the signal might have been caused by twinkling in space, like how stars twinkle in the sky. But even if that's true, it doesn't rule out the possibility that the signal was made by something artificial. Another idea is that it could have come from something spinning, like a lighthouse. Or maybe it was a signal that changed its frequency over time. Or it was just a one-time burst. It's been 50 years since a strange radio signal was caught. But recently, a new idea about its origin sparked up. Now, imagine a comet streaking through space, leaving a trail of gas behind it like a tail. This gas could be key to understanding the mysterious radio signal that caught astronomers' attention all those years ago. One of the astronomers looked at the WOW signal and thought it might be connected to a comet called 266P slash Christensen. Yeah, that's a mouthful. This comet is about 1,800 light years away. It wasn't known back in 1997 when the signal was first detected. But now, it could explain the strange radio waves. Comets can emit radio waves as they get closer to the sun. It's like the gases around them start buzzing with energy. This buzzing might be what the wow signal was all about. To test this theory, we used a radio telescope to listen for radio waves from other comets. We found that some comets did indeed emit radio waves at the same frequency as the WOW signal. Then we pointed the telescopes at this particular comet as it passed to the same part of the sky where the WOW signal was detected. The comet's radio waves could match up with the signal. And while the comet wasn't exactly in the same spot as the signal, it was close enough to feel like we were onto something here. It also might have been caused by hydrogen clouds from two comets, the ones we mentioned, and another one called P 2008Y2. Who picks these names? But not everyone is convinced by that idea. Some say that the theory about two comets causing the signal doesn't add up, because comets don't usually emit radio waves in the way needed to explain the wow signal. Also, the signal didn't repeat itself, and only happened once, which is weird if it's really a comet. They spread out their gases over a large area, 
so the signal would have lingered longer. The telescope used to detect the signal should have picked it up twice in a short time span, but it didn't happen that way. Also, the comet wouldn't have moved out of the telescope's view so quickly. This shows that we need to learn more about how and why comets emit these radio waves, especially at the same frequency as the WOW signal. There were also a lot of mysterious and interesting signals in space. Most of them come from natural events, like something called fast radio bursts. These bursts of energy are incredibly powerful and occur all over the sky, but their origins are still unclear. They last for only a fraction of a second. Maybe the telescope caught just a part of one of these bursts. There's also a strange signal we've been receiving since 2018. This one actually repeats every 22 minutes. But despite our efforts, we can't figure out where it's coming from. It started way back in 1988, and we've been investigating this mystery for 36 years now. At least here, we know the distance of the mysterious object sending the signals, a distant 15,000 light years away. Some speculate that these signals could be from extraterrestrial beings trying to communicate with us. However, we can't say for sure without solid evidence, so it remains speculative. Another explanation is a pulsar theory. Now, pulsars are neutron stars that emit beams of energy, similar to what we've been observing with the signals. However, the behavior of the signals doesn't perfectly align with what we know about pulsars. There's also the magnetar theory, suggesting that these signals could be coming from supercharged neutron stars called magnetars. Yet, none of these theories fully explain the strange behavior of the signals. Maybe there's a new, undiscovered phenomenon in the universe. So even though comets are a possibility, there are still a lot of unanswered questions about the WOW signal. We don't know what caused it, and we may never know. We don't even know if it came from deep space or from somewhere inside the solar system. In any case, even if the WOW signal had a natural cause, it doesn't mean that extraterrestrial life doesn't exist. The study that talked about this also discussed a sun-like star that could be a great place to look for signs of technology from space. There are 14 more stars similar to our sun in space, although we're not totally sure about their brightness. This opens up exciting possibilities for hunting down signs of advanced civilizations beyond Earth. Ooh. Now, get this. Octopuses are visitors from outer space. Here's how this would have happened. Ice-kept eggs of octopuses stuck in spatial bodies crashed into Earth. Then these guys would have mixed together with a pre-existing set of genetic information available on our planet. And presto, octopuses were born. Well, it may be a long stretch to justify that the highly intelligent octopuses are extraterrestrial beings. But the idea is based on a theory that has been around since ancient Greece, something known as panspermia. Now, panspermia is a hypothesis that says life exists all around the universe, not only in planets. So things such as space dust, asteroids, and even spacecraft have their share of life glued to them. And when they travel across the galaxy, life is disseminated. This strand of thought has been polemic, since it goes against the idea that all life originated right here on our planet. But as much as this new octopus theory might be refreshing, it doesn't contribute too substantially to the search for life on other planets. It's just too hypothetical. Now, octopuses are in fact incredibly old. The oldest known fossil belongs to an animal that lived almost 300 million years ago. FYI, this is before our dinosaur buddies roamed the Earth. Wait, there's more! Octopus arms have a mind of their own. That's because two-thirds of their neurons lie in their arms, not in their heads. This means that their arms can problem-solve how to open a shellfish, while their owner is worried about other stuff entirely. Talk about ninja-level multitasking. Oh, and like other animals, such as chimpanzees and dolphins, octopuses have proven to be good at maneuvering tools, like picking up old shells and using them as a temporary home. Now, of course, the most intelligent animals on our planet are humans, according to humans. But we don't seem to give pigs enough credit. Pigs are so smart they can play video games. No, not Minecraft. 
But in a recent academic study, scientists had four pigs play a joystick game. They had to manipulate the stick so that the moving ball would hit the wall and then they would get a treat. All four pigs did great in the test, which was surprising even to the scientists. Now, pigeons also aced an impressive test. They were trained to differentiate a Picasso painting from a Monet one, which they had no trouble learning. Then they were able to apply this knowledge, identifying works of art they had not previously seen, meaning they really understood the difference between each painter. Poor things are always seen as a nuisance. Now, if we placed kangaroos in an animal's most amazing ability contest, they'd win. It's mainly because they break the four-legged rule. A special species of kangaroo, the red kangaroo, uses its tail to help propel it forward. Now, visually, it has four limbs, but in practice, it uses five. They're biologically built to use their tail as a fifth limb, since it's packed with articulated vertebrae and thick muscles. Of course, it had to be an Australian animal. Okay, jokes aside, Australia is home to a variety of unique animals, like the most venomous snake in the world. This not-so-cute reptile is known as the Inland Taipan, and its venom is enough to take down a hundred humans. And still, on the topic of dangerous animals, the island is also home to one of the world's most venomous spiders, the funnel web spider which can be found not too far away from downtown Sydney. Yikes! Ah! The Little Mermaid may have shown us that life is good under the sea, but she didn't mention anything about the bizarre ways of the anglerfish. Anglerfish are those special types of fish that have a huge whip nose connected to the front part of their bodies. They look like they're forever holding a lantern in front of them, except that the little lantern they carry is a type of bioluminescence and is far from romantic as anglerfish use it to lure smaller fish in as their meals. It was back in 1999 that scientists discovered that these little guys spend most of their lives upside down. They had never seen anything like that. Hovering above the Pacific Ocean floor at a depth of around 16,400 feet, where light almost doesn't even reach, there they were. They do this because, since they live so close to the seafloor, their built-in lantern illuminates the ground in search of food. They might be weird, but they're also pretty clever. Recently, scientists have discovered a species of animal that has neither a brain nor a head and is pretty smart. Meet the brittle star. This five-armed creature is a bundle of nerves, and it has proved itself to be super clever. In a recent experiment, Scientists would dim the light while they fed brittle stars their favorite treat, yummy shrimps. After 10 months of conditioning, these babies would creep out of hiding as soon as the scientists turned off the light in the room they were in. Surely they were expecting to enjoy a delicious meal. Now we really shouldn't judge a brain by its size, or lack of brain in this case. There's something known as the orange cat behavior, and apparently it's not just a meme. So far, scientists have been able to understand that coat color is connected to a feline's gender. And since orange is an X chromosome, orange cats are usually males, like Garfield. The so-called orange cat behavior describes ginger cats as agents of chaos. Again, pretty much like Garfield. However, there haven't been any conclusive studies on whether coat color and cat behavior are truly linked. In terms of vision, Mantis shrimps probably have the most psychedelic vision out of all animals. These funny-looking creatures have a whopping 16 varieties of photoreceptors, with five of them reserved for the ultraviolet or UV spectrum. Ultraviolet rays are really short wavelengths, which are invisible to humans. The thing science still doesn't understand is how exactly these mantis shrimp view the world around them. Sure, they can perceive a bunch of colors, but they can't necessarily distinguish all of these colors among themselves. It can be that they just see a lot of really vivid, really blurry colors. But we haven't figured out a way to check that out. Now, to say sloths are cute is an understatement. They may be one of the friendliest animals in the jungle, but there's more. If you look closely at their fur coat, you'll notice hints of green. These greeneries are actually tiny little algae that grow alongside sloths. They help sloths to camouflage better in the jungle, but they also nurture them. 
The little cracks inside a sloth's fur create the perfect environment for algae reproduction, and scientists have found species of algae that don't exist anywhere else in the world. They do get by with a little help from their friends. Deep within the Sahara Desert, you'll find a little creature known as the fennec fox. This huge-eared animal adapted perfectly to survive in its hostile environment. The huge ears help them to dissipate the unbearable heat of the desert, as well as help them to hunt for underground prey. Now meet this guy. Unlike what its name might suggest, the red panda is closer to a raccoon than it is to a giant panda. You'll find a lot of these cat-sized creatures in the Himalayan region, hopping from tree to tree and bundled together trying to keep warm in the harsh weather. They're gentle and friendly, like their big panda cousins, and occasionally enjoy eating some bamboo sticks. And then there are bees. Compared to humans, bees' brains are the size of pinheads, yet they are capable of astounding things. Let's say a bee is running low on energy after a long search flight. This bee desperately needs a drop of honey in order to continue flying. But smartly enough, she doesn't need to go back to the hive to recharge. She can ask a fellow beehive mate for a drop of honey directly from this other bee's stomach and continue flying. This type of decentralized system allows them to build highly effective societies, one that bees don't need to push to the queues in front of the honey cells, for example. Hey, just kidding. It's the year 1977, and astronomers are stunned. They've just picked up a bizarre and really powerful radio signal coming from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. The signal shockingly matches the frequency of neutral hydrogen. What's the big deal? This is the very frequency many astronomers believe might be used by extraterrestrial civilizations trying to communicate. Since then, the signal has become legendary in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, aka SETI, community. But what exactly was that mysterious signal? To understand this, let's go back to the 1970s when the Ohio State University Big Ear Radio Telescope was active. For more than two decades, from 1973 to 1995, it played a major role in the university's SETI program. By the way, it was the longest-running SETI project in history. And in 1977, Big Ear detected something extraordinary, the WOW signal. This wasn't just any signal. It was a strong, narrow-band radio signal, right near the important neutral hydrogen frequency. The Big Ear telescope might be gone now, but the mystery of the WOW signal still fascinates scientists today. Imagine this. You want to tell an extraterrestrial civilization about humans. How would you describe our average height? We can't use feet or inches because these units mean nothing to them. Even here on Earth, we don't all use the same measurements. To communicate with other civilizations, we need a universal way of conveying information. Luckily, the emission of light by matter comes from an electron jumping between quantum states in an atom. This process, governed by quantum mechanics, results in specific and fixed radiation frequencies and wavelengths, no matter where you are in the universe. Since we believe the laws of physics are the same everywhere, these wavelengths are universal. This makes them a perfect standard of measurement that any civilization could understand. For example, on the Pioneer spacecraft's gold plaque, we used a particular wavelength as a unit of length to describe information about humans and the spacecraft's origin. So, if an extraterrestrial civilization wanted to talk to us, they could have used the frequency of the WOW signal. And that's pretty amazing. The signal lasted the entire 72 seconds that Big Ear was tuned in. A few days later, astronomer Jerry R. Amon was looking over the data when he spotted the unusual signal on a computer printout. He was so surprised that he wrote WOW next to it, and that's how the signal got its famous name. The signal also has another, not so exciting name, 6EQJ5. Some people thought it might be a hidden message, but it actually just shows how the signal's intensity changed over time. The WOW signal sparked all kinds of theories. Some people believed it was a sign of extraterrestrial life, while others were sure that it was some interference from human activities. 
there were those who believed it could be a natural phenomenon we didn't understand yet. New research seems to have finally solved the mystery, but there's one thing we'll talk about a bit later. First, let's get into detail. A team of scientists, led by Abel Mendez from the Planetary Habitability Laboratory at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo, revisited the mystery using data from the now-closed Arecibo Radio Telescope, collected between 2017 and 2020. These observations were similar to those made by Big Ear, but they had better sensitivity, resolution, and polarization measurements. Arecibo detected signals similar to the WOW signal, but there were some important differences. These signals were less intense and came from multiple locations. The scientists believe that these signals, including the original WOW signal, can be explained by natural events in space. Their theory sounds like this. The WOW signal was likely caused by a sudden brightening of hydrogen due to a strong, short-lived radiation source. It could be a magnetar flare or a soft gamma repeater, SGR. A magnetar is a neutron star with a way stronger magnetic field than ordinary neutron stars. And an SGR is an astronomical object which emits large bursts of gamma rays and X-rays at irregular intervals. In any case, such events are pretty rare and depend on very specific conditions. But they can cause hydrogen clouds to light up for short periods. According to the researchers, what Big Ear picked up in 1977 was one of those bright hydrogen clouds in its line of sight. The study suggests that the signal's rarity can be explained by the precise alignment needed between the radiation source, the hydrogen cloud, and the observer. It means that the WOW signal may actually be the first recorded instance of an astronomical maser flare in the hydrogen line. What if our moon was hollow? Would we be able to hide inside in case some terrible catastrophe destroyed our home planet? Well, the supporters of the hollow moon theory believe that it's actually a real option. The hollow moon is a hypothesis claiming that Earth's moon is either completely hollow or has quite a lot of place inside. The thing is, the moon is less dense than Earth, and it seems to support the idea of its hollowness. But according to science, the reason is the fact that Earth's upper mantle and crust are less dense than the heavy iron core of our planet. Then, there's also the claim that the moon rings like a bell. For almost a decade, between 1969 and 1977, seismometers installed on the moon by the Apollo missions kept recording moonquakes. The moon was reported to be ringing like a bell during such quakes, especially shallow ones. On the 20th of November, 1969, Apollo 12 deliberately crashed the ascent stage of its lunar module into the surface of our natural satellite. According to NASA, after that, the ringing continued for almost an hour. This made some people argue that the moon must be hollow like a bell. Later, lunar seismology researched those shallow moonquakes and showed that they acted differently than quakes on our planet, mostly due to differences in type texture and density of the lunar and Earth's rock layers. The speed of sound waves in solids is determined by the medium's compressibility and density. No one has ever found any evidence of a large empty space inside the moon. And still, in 1970, Michael Vassin and Alexander Sherbakov suggested a hypothesis that the moon could be a spaceship designed by mysterious extraterrestrial beings. In 1965, Writer Isaac Asimov made an observation that added fuel to the fire of conspiracy theories. He marveled at the sheer astronomical accident that the moon fits so snugly over the sun during total eclipses. The sun's greater distance makes up for the incomparably larger size of the star. As a result, it seems to us that the moon and the sun are the same size. The author added that there was no astronomical reason why the sun and the moon should fit so well. So since the 1970s, conspiracy theorists have been quoting Asimov's words about solar eclipses as evidence of the artificial origin of the moon. Mainstream astronomers disagree with such an interpretation, saying that the angular diameters of the moon and the sun don't perfectly match during eclipses. They vary by several percent over time, 
many other pieces of evidence confirm that the moon is a solid body that formed after a planetoid crashed into Earth. In the past, scientists thought that the moon appeared after our rapidly spinning planet got rid of a good chunk of its mass. This idea was suggested in 1879 by George Darwin, the son of the very Charles Darwin, the famous biologist. This theory remained popular until the Apollo missions. Then, in 1925, Austrian geologist Otto Ampferer offered another idea, that Earth and the Moon could have formed together from a primordial accretion disk, a rotating disk of dense gas and dust surrounding a young, newly formed star, and used to be a double system. The third theory stated that the Moon could have once been a planetoid caught by the gravity of our planet. The modern explanation usually involves the giant impact hypothesis. According to it, a Mars-sized space body hit Earth and created a debris ring around our planet. In the end, this ring gathered into a single natural satellite, our moon. But getting back to the hollow moon theory, at the moment, there's no scientific evidence to support this hypothesis. Seismic observations and other data indicate that the moon has a solid interior with several layers, a thin crust, quite extensive mantle, and a dense core. These days, the idea of the hollow moon is considered to be a conspiracy theory. A shocking theory claims that mysterious comet Oumuamua might be a von Neumann probe, an alien spacecraft with broken engines tumbling through our solar system. It sounds extremely unsettling, but first things first, what is a von Neumann probe? Mathematician John von Neumann suggested the concept of self-replicating spacecraft that could in some ways mimic the features of living organisms or viruses. People started to refer to such hypothetical spacecraft as von Neumann probes. Von Neumann was sure that using self-replicating spacecraft would be the most effective way to perform large-scale mining operations, like mining asteroid belts or moons. The creators of such probes could take advantage of their exponential growth. Hypothetically, a self-replicating spaceship could be sent to a neighboring planetary system and look for raw materials there. Such materials could be extracted from moons, gas giant planets, asteroids, and the likes. Using these materials, the probe could make replicas of itself. The replicas could then be sent to other planetary systems, and the original probe could pursue its main purpose within its parent star system. This pattern sure does repeat the reproduction patterns of bacteria. That's why some experts think that von Neumann machines could be considered a form of life. There's also a theory that a self-replicating spacecraft could spread throughout a galaxy the size of the Milky Way in just half a million years, even if it used conventional theoretical methods of interstellar travel. In other words, it wouldn't even need to employ exotic faster-than-light propulsion. In 1981, mathematical physicist and cosmologist Frank Tipler argued that extraterrestrial intelligence couldn't exist because people had never observed von Neumann probes. Even if we take a moderate rate of replication, such probes should already be common throughout space. So, it's really weird that we haven't come across any of those yet. It might only mean that extraterrestrial intelligence doesn't exist. A response to Tipler's arguments came from astronomers Carl Sagan and William Newman. They pointed out that Tipler might have underestimated the rate of replication, and von Neumann probes should have already started consuming most of the mass in our galaxy. Therefore, any intelligent race would avoid designing von Neumann probes in the first place and try to destroy any probes as soon as they found them. Another objection to the prevalence of von Neumann probes is that civilizations that could potentially design such devices have an extremely high probability of self-destruction before producing such a machine. In any case, the assumed capacity of von Neumann probes is unlikely in reality. But then, how about Oumuamua? These days, scientists are using high-tech scanners to examine a huge, cigar-shaped comet which might or might not be an alien probe. One idea is that it's an extraterrestrial civilization spacecraft with broken engines wandering through our solar system. If that's the case, the object could easily be a von Neumann probe. Dr. Jason Wright from Penn State University thinks that a broken alien spaceship 
could move in exactly the same way as Oumuamua. Rather than moving through space like other space rocks, the 1,318-foot-long, 118-foot-wide space traveler is tumbling through the solar system. At the moment, it's traveling at a speed of around 200,000 miles per hour. In his blog, Dr. Wright says that if such derelict craft were not traveling fast enough to escape the galaxy, they could thermalize with the stars and end up drifting around like an interstellar asteroid or comet. They wouldn't have attitude control anymore and would eventually start tumbling. And it could distinguish them from regular interstellar asteroids. Plus, even though their propulsion was broken, their radio transmitters could work just fine. In any case, so far, it's just a theory. And further research is needed. What do you think? Is Oumuamua just a space rock or an alien space probe? It is assumed that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy in our universe. These space monsters have been discovered in the centers of many galaxies, and our Milky Way is no exception. There is Sagittarius A at its center, a supermassive black hole surrounded by a hot, radio-emitting, accreting gas cloud. To accrete means to absorb matter from the surrounding space under the influence of gravitational forces. In the case of black holes, the attraction is incredibly strong. As a result, the radiation surrounding them is also immensely powerful. Observations made by the Event Horizon Telescope in 2022 made it possible to simulate this substance in our galaxy. From these observations, astronomers were able to estimate the mass of the black hole. It turned out to be a million solar masses, which is about a million times less than the mass of the entire Milky Way galaxy. So, one millionth of the mass of our galaxy is that supermassive black hole at its center. Such a ratio of the mass of the entire galaxy to the mass of the black hole at its center is characteristic of many observations. Moreover, the value of this ratio is reproduced within the framework of modern models. Now, let's discuss two hypotheses for the formation of supermassive black holes. The first model speaks about the creation of small seeds that describe the gradual increase in the mass of a black hole. The accretion of matter into a stellar mass black hole. The second model suggests that supermassive black holes form when large gas clouds collapse. In this case, the collapse occurs bypassing the stage of a supernova explosion, in which the explosion would scatter most of the mass, preventing the formation of a supermassive black hole. In any case, conceptually, such a process can be described this way. There's matter in some compact area, which is the seed for the growth and development of a black hole. Black holes accrete matter around them and their mass increases. It is important that the evolution of black holes is a temporary process that scientists want to study in dynamics. But how can one see evolution that takes place over millions or even billions of years? Unfortunately, or fortunately, light from a distant galaxy takes time to reach us. That's why if we look at very distant objects, we will see them as they were in the past due to the propagation delay of light. But to look far into the past, one needs to look at very distant objects. The light from them is very difficult to observe experimentally. The good news is that with the launch of the ultra-precise James Webb Space Telescope, scientists can study even faint signals from galaxies that formed when the universe was about a billion years old. That is, looking back almost 14 billion years. One of the most surprising results obtained from James Webb is the discovery of a lot of galaxies within two billions of years of life of the universe. These galaxies have active galactic nuclei, faint compact regions at the centers of galaxies, emitting large amounts of energy. Here, the space telescope shows its power. These active galactic nuclei have luminosity that are thousands of times lower than the luminosity of quasars detected in ground-based studies. They appear red because they are dusty. The dust obscures black holes and reddens the colors. So they're called little red dots. What is very important 
Their masses lie between 10 and 100 million solar masses. Surprisingly, using very advanced analysis methods, scientists can estimate the mass of a black hole at the center of a little red dot. It turns out that it reaches millions of solar masses. It means that the mass of a black hole at the center of such a little red dot is only several orders of magnitude less than the mass of an entire galaxy. I'll remind you that the supermassive hole at the center of our galaxy is millions of times smaller than the mass of the entire universe. Thus, the ratio of the mass of supermassive black holes at the centers of such galaxies to the mass of the entire galaxy is phenomenally large. But explaining this fact will be a difficult problem for current models of black hole evolution. One of the hypotheses that scientists are now working on is that it's not a black hole that forms from a seed at the center of a galaxy, as we discussed earlier. It's a galaxy that forms around the already created black hole. Such black holes are called primordial black holes. This is a hypothetical type of black hole that was formed not due to the gravitational collapse of a large star, but in super-dense matter during the initial expansion of the universe. If it turns out that these primordial black holes do exist, it will open up a new window for dark matter models. But this is a topic for another video. Recently, an international team of astronomers has used the James Webb Space Telescope to find evidence for an ongoing merger of two galaxies and their massive black holes, and it happened when the universe was a mere 740 million years old. The double black hole system is known as ZS7. This is the most distant detection of a black hole merger ever. Plus, it's the first instance of such a phenomenon detected so early in the universe. But let's look into the details. Astronomers have been locating different supermassive black holes with masses of millions to billions of times the mass of the Sun situated in the most massive galaxies in the local universe, including our home Milky Way galaxy. Those giant black holes most likely had an immense impact on the evolution of the galaxies where they dwell. At the same time, scientists don't fully understand how those objects got to be so massive. The discovery of such monstrous, fully formed black holes means that their growth occurred very quickly and very early. Massive black holes that are actively accreting matter have special features that allow astronomers to detect them. These features are usually not visible from the ground but can be observed with the help of James Webb. So, researchers found evidence for very dense gas clouds with rapid motions close to the resulting giant black hole. Plus, they detected hot and highly ionized gas illuminated by energetic radiation, like the one typically produced by black holes in their accretion periods. With the incredible sharpness of the telescope's imaging capabilities, scientists also managed to spatially separate the two black holes. One of these holes has a mass that is 50 million times the mass of the sun. The mass of the other black hole is likely to be similar but it's much more difficult to measure it since this second hole is surrounded by a thick cloud of gas. These findings suggest that mergers are a crucial way through which black holes can grow extremely fast, and they could do it already at cosmic dawn. After analyzing other Webb's findings of active massive black holes in the distant universe, researchers have come to the conclusion that massive black holes have been influencing the evolution of galaxies from the very beginning. Once the two black holes merge completely, they will also generate gravitational waves. Such events are supposed to be detected by the next generation of gravitational wave observatories, such as the upcoming Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, aka LISA, mission. It has been recently approved by the European Space Agency. This mission will be the first space-based observatory dedicated to studying gravitational waves. The results we get from James Webb tell us that lighter systems detectable by LISA might be more frequent than we used to think. It will likely make researchers adjust their models for LISA rates in a similar mass range. Currently, astronomers are planning to study in detail the relationship between massive black holes and their host galaxies in the first billion years. 
An important part of this program is systematic search for and characterization of black hole mergers. It will help us determine the rate at which black hole merging occurs in the early universe. Plus, with the help of this research, we can figure out the rate at which gravitational waves have been produced from the dawn of time. Our home Milky Way galaxy has two very well-known satellite galaxies, the large and small Magellanic Clouds. They were named after Ferdinand Magellan, an explorer who led the first circumnavigation of the globe a whopping 500 years ago. During this expedition, two groups of clouds were discovered in the southern night sky. Those are now known as the Magellanic Clouds. But they're not the only ones. The Milky Way is surrounded by at least 61 other galaxies within 1.4 million light years. For comparison, our neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, is 2.5 million light years away from us. And still, astronomers think there are many more satellite galaxies, perhaps even too many. But first, let's figure out what a satellite galaxy is. Our sun is just one of a truly huge collection of stars in the Milky Way. Hundreds of billions of stars orbit the center of our galaxy. But something much bigger orbits the Milky Way's center too, other galaxies. They are way less massive, but have their own stars. We can compare the Milky Way to our sun and those other galaxies to planets. Astronomers call such formations satellite galaxies. The Milky Way's biggest satellite galaxy is the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's located about 163,000 light years away and is about one hundredth the size of our home galaxy. Unlike the spiral Milky Way, the Large Magellanic Cloud doesn't have a clean spiral shape. One theory claims that it's because the Milky Way and other galaxies pull and warp it. In terms of distance, there are two candidates that can fight for the title of the closest satellite galaxy. One of them is so small that scientists consider it a dwarf galaxy. The other is so close that it's still debated whether it's a separate dwarf galaxy or part of our own galaxy. The satellite galaxy everyone agrees on is the Sagittarius dwarf spheroidal galaxy. It's around 50,000 light years away from the center of the Milky Way. But there's a cluster of stars that is even closer than that. Some experts call it the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy. It's likely to contain about a billion stars and is located so close to the edge of the Milky Way that it's actually closer to our solar system than to the galaxy's center. Some astronomers don't think the Canis Major is its own galaxy. They believe it's simply a dense area of faraway stars, which is still part of the Milky Way. Whatever the case is, this bunch of stars was once pulled toward the Milky Way by our galaxy's immense gravity. That's how most satellite galaxies in the area are likely to end up. Once, they might all merge into an even larger Milky Way galaxy. But let's get back to the assumption that the Milky Way has too many satellite galaxies. A team of astronomers has been hunting for such galaxies using the Subaru telescope. So far, they have searched a mere 3% of the sky. And still, they have found nine previously undiscovered satellite galaxies. That's far more than they expected to spot. Interestingly, most of the satellite galaxies orbiting the Milky Way are newcomers. Yes, even the large and small Magellanic Clouds. This most recent research hopes to improve our understanding of our corner of the universe with the first detailed search for companion dwarf galaxies. However, the study also has another goal, to figure out dark matter distribution. You see, the current theory claims that the mass of our galaxy consists of two parts. Visible matter, like stars and planets, and something invisible, which is hypothetical dark matter. We can't see it directly, but we can feel its gravitational influence through a certain distribution of mass in galaxies. Strangely, the simulation of the dynamics of the galaxy and this dark matter predicts hundreds of satellite galaxies in the Milky Way. Until recently, we only knew about a few of them, which created a contradiction known as the missing satellite problem. Hopefully, the new research will solve this problem. The team admits that so far their research has been based on statistically small numbers. Several assumptions have also been made based on a particular distribution of satellite galaxies. Follow-up studies of stars in the satellite galaxies and high-resolution imaging are definitely needed to progress further.